have, have you ever found yourself uh, kind of helpless? And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a super serious thing like, uh, you know, it being, uh, uh, being um, you know, in, in a dangerous situation. Or, but, but really, that there was there was really nothing that, that you could, could, could do to overcome the, the situation that, that you were in. Um, years ago, before I um, buried in Jess, I was a bachelor living on my living on my own. And I, I would often go up to our, our county park in Barnes where we go go run in the evenings. And uh, they might just live a little more than a mile. Um, but you're not like our, our park here, and and, uh, and so I would go and run. And I had, um, you know, the, you don't want to be when you're running. Well, you don't want to be bogged down with a lot of. of of weight, so you know, you kind of limit the things that they, that you carry. And so I had a big old, you know, like janitor set of keys that I didn't want to uh, to have to be, you know, that, that I had to secure. And so what I would uh, do is I would take my car key off of there because you, know, you don't leave the car unlocked. But so I took the car key off, and then I would uh, secure it to my, myself in one way or or the other. And so this time. I had the not so bright idea of I was going to put it in my, my hat, just keep it up there, you know, that way uh, it's skirt, that's not going to be out to come out. Shorts that I had on this time didn't have any, any pockets in them. I mean, you know, if you stick it in your shoe, it's going to slide out, you're going to get sweaty and all. So I put it, put it in my hat, and uh, which worked out very, very well for, um, you know, several miles. Being in the summer, uh, it gets, gets hot even in the evening, and there's this one part uh, to, in, in the park where it, I guess it's just where the sun hits it, it's warmer than, than the other areas, and so I could just feel the, the sweat build up and build up, and, and so uh, I did what you can, uh, you can imagine, is uh, I took my hat off to, to wipe my, my forehead to, to get the sweat out of my eyes, and in doing so, yep, you guessed it right, I also uh, lost my, my car key. Uh, now, which would have been okay if I had heard it to, to drop, but you know, I didn't want the big set of keys, but I did have my phone so that I could listen to, to music as, as I ran. So I wasn't you know, listening, it didn't, and it was uh, several miles later until I finished the run, and then I get back to the car, take off my hat, and oh no, it's not, it's not there. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? So, you know, it not to be that, that guy that doesn't at least try to, uh, you know, to, to, to solve the problem himself. I started walking around uh, the, the, the track looking, and of course, you got to see the key anywhere. And so, I, thankfully, uh, my co-worker at the time, her husband was a deputy sheriff the sheriff's department. And, uh, and and so I called, called her and said, hey, are you with your husband? She said, yeah, yeah, we're both. Uh, uh, um, we just got done eating dinner. I said, Can I ask a favor of oh, you? Uh, we were like mothers, so she said, What did you do this time? And I said, Well, I kind of locked myself out of my out of my car. And she's like, Okay. Uh, and so so Greg came out and uh, he had the, the little kit where he's wedged in there and you can open it up to at least open the car. Now this is how smart that I am. I just revealed it all. I had a spare key. I had a spare key. Um, and, and, and because I didn't want to lose that spare key, I kept it right inside of the car. And uh, which does do a whole lot of, of, of good when you need it. Um, but in that case, it, it made a really bad situation to, from going to to worse. And so we looked around and obviously still did not did not find the key. But thankfully I was able to, to call for help. And the help arrived, although I took quite a bit of ridicule for it. And I was able to get home and eventually get another key made to where I was not stranded. But in that moment, I mean, it was the sun is going down, you're at a party, you're, you're, you begin to think, all right, what am I going to do? You, you run through that list of all of the things that you think that might that might help you until, honestly, you just get so desperate that you're just praying that somebody is there to, to help you. Well, in today's passage, John chapter 9, we're going to encounter a man that... Um, had a far serious, uh, or more serious uh, problem than, than, than I, I, I did. Uh, for this man was a blind person. And 
Uh, they didn't just have a, you know, just a temporary type of blindness. He wasn't just legally blind to where, you know, he could kind of see and get around. No, he was, he was blind from, from birth. And uh, in, in the biblical times, here in the first century, to be blind pretty much means that, um, that you're destitute. There's really no hope for you. You don't have the uh, Disabilities Act to create accommodations for you to be able to uh, to, to read and, and braille or to have, you know, with the, the sidewalks with little things so that your sticks can, can see or have seen eye dogs to help you know. Not only that, you, you couldn't even get a job. You couldn't, really, your, your family would probably not want to be around you. And so that's the case of this blind man, as many others who had physical disabilities, uh, were beggars. And they would find themselves begging outside of, of the synagogue. Now, this is not the first blind man that we've encountered in our uh, uh, study through the Gospel of, of John. But we're going to find that Jesus' uh, approach to the solution to this problem is a little different. So let's uh, start reading here. We're going to read start, uh, through the first seven verses. John chapter 9. As he passed by, he saw a man blind at the birth of Jesus. And the disciples asked him, you know, Rabbi, who had sinned this man or his parents that he was that he was born blind? Now, you might think, okay, what do you mean this man has sinned? You know, why in the world are they, they you know, questioning the, the, the integrity or, uh, of this person? And, and it, it really goes back to the, to the Old Testament in that uh, we call this this retribution principle. Uh, meaning that not, it may not even be your sin, maybe it's your family's sin. So that based on their sin, it causes bad things to, to happen to you, right? Heard it said even today, this karma is going to get you, right? You do bad things, but bad things are going to, to happen. Now, uh, this is uh, not an absolute promise. There are cases where people were, um, you know, the, the generations did suffer. But let's face it, the state of that our world is if we live in a fallen world. So indirectly, disease and, and disabilities and a brokenness and death, war is a result of sin. It is a result of the fact that we live in a sinful, fallen world. And there are consequences for, for some sins that, that one will, will reap, but that's not necessarily the case all the time. So Jesus explains here, he said, uh, he said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in them. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming and no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. So, you know, it's hard for us to, to think sometimes because when, when bad things do happen to you, whether it is us to someone we love or even when we just see in the news of a catastrophe like a, the flooding maybe in eastern Kentucky or, or a death or war, it, 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 we might begin to wonder why are we having to suffer once again? But, but have you ever thought that maybe the suffering that you are in right now might be so that God may, his works may be displayed through you. Sometimes our suffering is, is a test. I mean, it, it, it's easy to, to do everything right and say we, we love Jesus and we're, we're strong in our faith and everything's going good. But when it is truly tested, that's when we know whether or not uh, we're, we're our true allegiance, true allegiance lies. And, and so Jesus is saying here, in this case, no, look, it's here so that God can be glorified so that the works of him can be displayed through what I am going to, to do. So Jesus, he, he said, no, he healed this man. So what does he do? Well, he, he doesn't just say, hey, you're healed, as has happened earlier. Or say, you know what, you need to go and to... Uh, you know, to go and to, to, to um, you know, to, to do this, go tell others, pick up your mat and, and, and walk as he healed the, 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 the lame man. Now this time, Jesus gets down on, uh, on his, you know, kind of on his knees, and he, and he says here that, that, uh, that he, he, he spits on the ground. So he 
and just fits right there on the ground. And then he kind of runs and moves his fingers, his hands in the ground to, to take the dirt that is there to make mud. And so then he takes this mud and he puts it on the man's eyes. Now, those of you who are in the medical profession, public health, I don't know, obviously I'm not, I, but I would say to say, say that that's probably not a wise thing to do. I mean, you don't know what kind of contaminants are in the ground. We don't know, you know, uh, just dirt is not a good thing, to, to especially to come into contact with something as sensitive as, as one's eyes. We would probably expect that that's going to make it worse. Uh, but not with Jesus. So Jesus takes this and puts it in, and he gives this man a, a, a command. He gives him a task. He says, you, in verse 7, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. And so he went and he washed. And what happened? He came back to see. Have you ever wondered, you know, why does Jesus act in the ways that, that he does? <clears throat> And we, we, we see a variety here in how he is has healed people, right? Sometimes it's just a command. Right? Sometimes people are healed just by the very touching of his of his garment. And, and, and but here in the case, Jesus actually used a, it was kind of an object lesson. He, he took something that was uh, there that honestly was something that no one would ever expect to be have healing powers. It wasn't some special, you know, mud cream that you know would would, would, would heal some. But I thought I'm sure somebody's tried to make a, a buck off of that. Um, but there's a couple of reasons why, why Jesus uh, did this. Um, one is specifically, I believe, to, to this passage it, itself is, is that, um, is that we, we know that, that Jesus here healed this man, not on just any day, but he healed him on the Sabbath. And so, yes, it was part of the good of this man, but we also know that, that Jesus has also come to fulfill the law and to expose the hypocrisy in the Pharisees who keep the law in their minds, but, but yet they, they reject Jesus, who is that fulfillment of, of the law. And so this is going to come to a head a little later on. And so Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath, but he also... There's also another thing that you're in. So while you're dealing with the mud specifically, there is there's Jewish law, not in, 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 in Scripture, but in their laws that they made so that they don't break any other laws, um, is actually says that you are prohibited from kneading dough on the Sabbath. Right? So it's bread lovers are out of luck. You know, though there's no kneading dough. On the Sabbath, you would have to do it, I guess, on, on uh, you know, the day before. But so Jesus is down on the ground. The language that John uses is not coincidence here. He is kneading this mud, dirt, and water to make mud, to make this paste to put on the on the blind man's eyes. But we also see that Jesus is also testing this this blind person. Now he doesn't always do that. We, we, we see that in the encounter with, with, with Saul on the Damascus road, right? right? God blinded him and knocked him off his horse and, and saved him right then and there. But there are other times, as in the case here, where Jesus says, I want you to go and to do this. A task of, do you really believe that I had the power to to, 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 to heal you, to save you, not just from your physical ailment, but from your, your spiritual disease. And so the man went and washed. And he came back. Let's pick up here, verse 8. So this next scene, the neighbors of the blind man and those that had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Or some say, It is he. And others just said, no, but but he isn't like him. But he kept saying, well, okay, who do you think I am the man? And so they said to him, then how are your eyes open? And he answered, the man called Jesus made much and anointed my eyes. And he said, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. And then they said, well, where is he? 
He said, I do not know. Now we know from the just kind of the continuation in this section, John, that that, that um, one of the Pharisees are ready to kill Jesus because they they, they hate him and what he represents. But the, the other Jews, it, it's kind of a, a complicated, right? Uh, they, they they see what Jesus does, and they're drawn to to his goodness, to his power. But but then when he talk, starts talking and explaining who he is, then they they don't like what they hear, and then they. They try to reject him. And so here we don't get the exact motives as to why they want to know where this Jesus is. For some, it may be they want to see him do more miracles, but for others, they, they may want to call him. <clears throat> but we see that the neighbors is better. Somebody that they saw day in and day out that was, was blind. Some of them may have helped him in certain ways, gave him alms, or, or brought him food or things to, to, to help him to, to get by, but, but they never saw him as one of, of them, a, a person, a human, made in God's, in God's image. No, he wasn't identified as anyone other than a, than a beggar. And so when they see him with his eyes open, they know that this is not, this is not an ordinary they knew that Jesus, as he had said, is the one that healed him. So in verse 13, we can pick it up. It says they, they, they brought in the neighbors, brought this blind man to the Pharisees. He man had been formerly blind. And, and now it was the Sabbath day, but Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So here it is. The Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, or how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I watched. And I, some of the Pharisees said, oh, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. So these Pharisees are questioning this man who was once a blind but now can, can see. <laughs> and what's interesting and, and sad at the same time is, is how they regard this person. You could even say they see him as a person. How they interact. Because what is the question that they, they ask? It's how did you receive your sight? You know, they didn't have, there was no cataracts or you couldn't get Lasix to, you know, to, to, to remove the things. They're like, this is, you should not be, be seen. You should be down here and still out there begging for, for things and allowing us to, 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 to you know, to, to help you. It's like, this isn't right. How were you healed? So he explained, he said, look, it was Jesus. And they said, how he, he did that? Men, what did they say? They were amazed that, that, that he could see. No, they, they would go on and say, well, this man is not from God, I mean Jesus, because he does not keep the Sabbath. They're more concerned about Jesus putting his hand in some dirt, moving it around to make mud, then they are the fact that this person's life has been radically changed. Interesting here yeah. is that this, this man, this once beggar, can now see was blind. But in reality, it's the Pharisees that are blind. For they do not want to see really the value in this person. But even more importantly, they do not see that Jesus is the Son of God. And so they ask, well, what do you say about this man that healed you? Who do we? God, he is a prophet, which would be how he would experience looking at the prophets of the old. That, that is... It is what he would find that would be the highest honor that, that, that he could give with knowing what he knows. So in verse 18, pick it up, it says the Jews did not believe 
that he had worked in blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say has been born blind? How then does he now see his parents out? Answer, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but, but how he know, now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, and he will speak of himself. There is no one who should love a child more than his or her parents. I want to know one of the primary roles of a parent is one to love, to nurture, but also to protect, to protect their own, own child. And what is so sad is that their parents are more afraid of the Pharisees than they are of protecting their own child. Were they throw him under the bus? When John gives us this, we have a note in verse 22. It says, His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone would confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. They didn't defend their own son. When we see even how their his own parents valued their own child. One that was once a better, but now he can see that, look, we don't want anything to do with this. Look, you do with them whatever you see fit. You, you go ask Heal with his eyes. And so they do. Verse 24, we continue on. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, for we know that this man is a sinner. Now, <laughs> that was just, again, so ironic. Again, they believe this retribution principle that they believe that he was blind because of some sin that, we, he, that he committed. But what we see, especially as we look back at earlier when Jesus uh, was with the woman caught in adultery, that, that he called these Pharisees out for their own sin. Not only do they see themselves physically superior, but they see themselves morally and spiritually superior to this, to this beggar. And so what does he do? Does he come off with, you know, a flight bag? Does he go with some deep theological comment? No. Honestly, at this point, we're not even sure that he's truly a follower of Christ. But what he says here is a verse you all know. He said, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that though I was blind, now I see. They ask, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And again, they, hey, look, I told you already, and you won't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Oh, it didn't tell like this. I don't know if he's being facetious here or, or if he's truly uh, just out of his own naivete. Either way, I love it. He says, Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> and they answer him. And when it says they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to them. Never, since the world began, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man were blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born out of sin, and you would teach us? They said, cast him out. We see, again, it's the irony here that these men who are men of God, we see how they are acting, honestly, far from God. And we know that their hearts were before they rejected the Son of God. And yet this beggar who was supposedly born into sin is the one that 
is showing God is. The one that is showing spiritual maturity. So we pick it up in verse 35. Jesus now hears that they cast this man out. And so he goes and he finds him and he says, Did, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And here he is. Verse 36. He answered, And who is he, sir? That I may believe in him. He wanted to know who. He didn't want to know who is the person that, that healed me, that calls me to be able to, to see. No. He said, Who is the Son of Man? So that I can believe. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him. And it is that he was speaking to him. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment, I came into the, this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become born. Some of the Pharisees near him heard of these things, and they said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, then you would have no guilt. But now you say that we see your guilt remains. Now what Jesus is saying here to these Pharisees is he's saying if you were truly blind, then, then you would not be guilty of, of breaking the law of Moses. But he's saying, you know that. You, you are, of, of all people, know the word of God better than anyone, and, and yet you object, yet you reject the person whom the word is all about. So because of that, they are guilty of sin, and they face judgment. Jesus came. So you see, in this to working out of this man to bring sight to the blind. He, he healed those that, that had physical disabilities, physical ailments, but, but we know that that was not his primary mission. No, it was so that he could heal them, give them life from their, from their sin. But we know that we are all sinners. And we're all in sin and falling short of the glory of God. The good news of the gospel is for while we were yet sinners, who Christ came to die for us. Salvation. Uh, uh, being uh, able to see does not come from anything that we can do. I mean, I can do my best and, and make some mud. We can wipe it on everybody's eyes and ear, and all your best thing you're going to probably do is get some type of infection. Right? But Jesus come to save sinners. It came to save men and women like this beggar, like the woman who was caught in adultery. He came to save people like you and, and like me. But just like this man, and unlike the Pharisees at this point, we must accept him. We must see him as the Son of Man who came to what, take away the sins of, of the world. And we must believe in him, not just with our minds, but trust him with our hearts. And when we do that, the scales fall off of our eyes and we can see God through Jesus in the goodness that he truly is. And the beauty of the gospel is, is one, yes, it does secure our, our hope for eternity in heaven, but it also gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to see others as Jesus sees them. We live in a day and time where, where it is we, it, it, it's, we, we see the, the devaluing of, of life. Whether that is through abortion or through uh, through murdering crime, we see devaluing of life through injustices like like racism and and those that and and, and how we might approach those that uh, you know that that society seems as uh, as a detriment to uh, to humanity. But we also see the devaluing of life in 
and, and how we interact with one another. I mean, we, we see it during on social media and, and how people talk to one another, treat one another, and, and we see it. And the thing is, it's easy to get wrapped up in it because we don't think that we are that we are uh, blasting another person. We don't see them as as another human being. And friends, that's the problem. We are all in the image of God. <coughs> Just as the Pharisees you know, were a, a hindrance to to, to those coming into it, because they care more about their tradition. They care more about doing the way things are supposed to be, be looking presentable. I love how uh, the theologian of Warren Wiersbe put it. He, he said that the Pharisees were known as the conservative ones in, in, in society. And to be honest, here, the 21st Christians, for the most part, at least, and, 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 and the, the, the Southern Baptist culture are considered certain conservatives. Now, I'm not speaking solely in political sense, although it does affect how we might approach politics, but, but what conservatism means is that we are conserving things of the past, things that we that are good, things that, that, that are our core values, things that we hold near and dear. And then we apply those to the current day. But what Wiersbe says that the Pharisees were doing, and what we all need to be cautioning ourselves for, is they weren't conservatives, they were preservatives. Meaning that they sought to keep everything the way that it was. Everything. The, whether it is, in their mind, everything was the, the good and the bad. And listen to this danger of, of not just being conservative, but being a preservative one in society. So for those of, uh, of you that, that, that grew up in the, uh, you know, the early part of the 1900s through the mid part, you might say, look, I loved it when life was more simpler and, and everything, and if we could just get back to the way it was in the 50s, right after the, the war, everything was booming and life was good and... and that, that may be true for, for life, but what would you say of an African American person who had just got done fighting for their country, came back home, and was told, sorry, you can't drink out of that water fountain. You can't eat at that restaurant. So the preservative says, we need everything to be the way that it, it was, we, but, but in reality, that is not. <laughs> That's not at all what we want. But if we're not careful, that can even creep in into the church. Right? So we're more concerned about preserving the, the, the legacy, the way things, the way things have always been in the church, and what we end up doing is, is kind of not seeing the need for us to be able to be open and reaching to those who need to hear about us, whether that is like this beggar or maybe somebody, you know, who is a, a low professional that has no need for Christ. I may have mentioned it before, but a uh, church consultants went in, and this has been several years ago, probably almost a decade ago, and a church that had dwindled down was a huge church, several hundred people, and, and they dwindled down to, to less than 50 people, mostly, mostly uh, elderly people. But they, 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 at least they had recognized that, look, this is, you know, that this is, we were really going strong and, and, and now we're on the verge of, they, they were getting to the point where they, they were unable to, to, to always pay all of their bills. And so they, they bring in this consultant, they pay for him to come in, and they, they, uh, they wanted to see what can, do we need to do to, to, uh, to ensure that, you know, that we're not going to have to close the church. And so, and, and so this consultant said, well, said, the first question that I just want to you know, throw away is, one, is there anything that you are not willing to change? Right? Is there anything that you're, that, that's just got to stay away that, that we can't, you know, that we don't need to touch? I think maybe it's, you know, doctrinal things like, you know, we, you know we're not going to water down the scripture or, or, uh, or maybe, you know, the focus on, on, on missions and, you know, things like, like, like that deep core values. And they're like, well, no, 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 we're doing, look, we know we got to, we need to change. 
But in one verse, it's oh God, sit up. Except, you know what? We see all of these new churches and even old churches now. They're just trying to, you know, they're trying to become hip and cool and adapt to the times. And, and you know, they're putting out these big, ugly screens and just, and they just messes with the decor of our, 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 our sanctuary. And, just, and, and you know what? We've got everything that we need in our hand. We don't need any of that new. Look, it's, you know what? I'm willing to change it, but we don't want any of those screens. <laughs> Like Philip said in the book of the Red, he said, he said, I realized that I I was in a losing battle. And he said, I just got to uh, close my uh, uh, folder with my notes and I put it back in my bag and said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And it wasn't so much about the, the screen or the decor of, of the church halls or the debates that can be had. It wasn't. You know, the devaluing of our old hymns that we that we, we love and dear so much. No. What it was is it revealed that they were more concerned about preservation than they were about conservation. And he said, he said, I hate to tell it. He said, I pray that we can change, but he said, right now, give you probably about six months before you have to close this church. And he was wrong. It wasn't six months, but it was within a year. They ended up closing the doors and selling the But we're at an interesting time right now. Thankfully, it seems like we're on the other side of, 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 of the COVID pandemic. I continue to pray for, for good results that, that we, we've seen thus far. We're not out of the woods yet. And I don't think there's ever going to be a time today where we're going to say, you know, like, that, like this is the day, you know, that, that, that we're done and our victory day. I don't think it's going to be that way. But we're, we're seeing, you know, good signs. And, and, and so, uh, but one of the challenges for, for many churches is, is, you know, we survived one of those challenging seasons in a generation, if not a century. But what are we going to do for the next season? That we are. The studies have been done just kind of looking at indicators, predicting, you know, what is the church going to look like? And as of right now, they're predicting about one in five churches uh, to close their doors in, in the next probably year or so. Because of so many financially have been just trading a water because they kept their buildings closed so long. Others have lost people. Others, people have just gotten out of the habit of going to church and it's just, they just don't see the need, the need for it. I think one in five, I mean, that, that's, I mean, look at our community. How many churches are there in town, around, you know, out in, out in the county? Absolutely. You can't take that as gospel, I mean, well, the, the, the future, but what that gives us cause of concern is, is that is that things are gonna be gonna be different in some ways. Things are gonna go back to the way they were in, in other things, not just the church, but in in, in reality. And you know, in some ways, you know, I love being around people, but you know, I mean, if you've ever been to a UK football or basketball game, thankfully, basketball, you've been in the seats, but, um, you know, we're crammed on top of people sitting there watching it. And, I mean, there's people I like, but when it's 95 degrees, I don't want people sitting on top of me. So, you know, I think we're going to have to space it out. You know, I think some of those things might be, might be good, but others, you know, we're going to miss those things. But as I was looking at this passage, it's this idea of conserving and preserving. Is may we be conservative, not preservative. We don't want to seal this church up in a Ziploc bag and put it in the freezer so that it might might last for six months or or a, a year and keep everything exactly the way that that it is, so that that we can say, you know what? I just remember church the way that it that it was. We could just get the way that it was, man. God would be God would be good. But instead, that we be concerned that, that we cling to the things that we value. 
those good things that, 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 that give us purpose, meaning, that means that we are faithful to who God is, like the, 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 the importance of God's word and, and how we believe that it is in there, that it never returns void, that it is authoritative, that we can trust it. That we would never lose our, our gospel focus and believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. That we would never lose our, our, our passion and value and mission to seeing the gospel go around to the world, seeing new churches being planted, and uh, to, to see others that, that, yes, churches may look different than us, they may seem different, wear different clothing than us, but hey, if they trust in Jesus, praise the Lord. And we see ministries like disaster relief strengthen and grow because we know that look, that life is hard and we need to be people at their woes when they are in need. They be clean too. You know, the, 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 the good the good hymns of, of the faith and the, the good newer songs that, that are being brought about so that, not that so much that you know, we may enjoy it, although we want to enjoy it. We want to have fun. But most importantly, that it brings honor and glory to God for who He is, for what He has done. You know, and I uh, just realized this, this past week, some of you probably realized it earlier than I had. Uh, I was uh, went through back in, in our history books and was reading the other day. Uh, it was neat looking at the different pictures and seeing younger versions of, of, of some of you that are here. Uh, seeing younger versions of some of those that uh, are not here but yet are looking to come back here very shortly. And it was, uh, it was it's neat to see uh, one of the different pastors that have come and gone to see the, the 1931 uh, building and then right after that when we added on to the sanctuary it looks so much different than what we have here right now. And uh, and, uh, and to see, even now, I've never really seen pictures of what the basement looked like before it had been remodeled. And to see everybody down there fellowshipping and enjoying being with each other. And uh, to see pictures of like the King's kids going traveling and, and, and seeing. And, and to read some of the, the things and to hear about some of the challenging times that the church has faced. But to see how. The church did not preserve itself, but it conserved itself to the new, to the new future. And it was in all of that, really, I got to the very end of, of, of one of the, the binders that I realized that this year is a special year. Yes, we have survived COVID-19, but this is also the 90th anniversary of Central Baptist Church, 2021. 90 years of God's faithfulness. Right here in the east end of May. Has anybody seen any changes down in the east end? <laughs> anybody seen any changes in the community of us? <laughs> no. Absolutely. But God's faithful. God, as long as we are faithful to Him, I believe. The one that 90 is not just, you know, we don't just look to the past. Oh, yes, we do. And we love and cherish it. We remember. I mean, we remember the good times that we've seen and we, we miss those that, that we see that we that are not here. But we also look to the future and say, what is God going to continue to do? Not just post COVID, not just post pandemic, but what's he going to do for the next 90 years? To be honest with you, none of us are here. What is our legacy going to be? Over the next um, several months <laughs> leading up, I want us to have a big celebration in November of that anniversary. Uh, Lord willing, COVID does not, you can pray that we're able to do so, but uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. But um, as I want us to be one, to be celebrating the past and our heritage and our, our values 
And I also want us to look with anticipation to, to the future. Oh, and, uh, and I think we're going to kind of, this thing, this name, and it is not the, uh, I can't take credit for it, a good friend of mine that came up with it, coined this term. The next phase, whatever long that is, whatever that looks like, uh, but post COVID, post 2021, the new Google finishing out the century of, of Central Baptist Church is. I want us to look to the future of the past. You might think that's an oxygen form. How can we get the future of, of the past? But that's, that's being conservative, is that we look to the past, that we embrace the values of who we are as a church and how God has gifted us, and we, and we take those things to the future to see the new people calling to faith in Christ. And to see this church not just to grow numerically, but grow spiritually, and to see us be a beacon in this community and around the world. The future of the past. The future of the past. And it's up to us through being faithful to God's word, following his lead. One thing I've been amazed at over this past year, you realize that next Sunday is the first Sunday that we close down because of COVID. Seems like a decade ago. I tell you, I'm so tired. There have been Many days where I'll wake up, I just, I mean, that is all to be, we're weary. But the good thing is God gives us the, the power and the, the strength to carry on to do what we never thought we would be able to do. What would this church look like if COVID happened a decade ago? I don't know. We can't, um, we can't predict that. But, um, but for here and now, God has been faithful to He's equipped us to not just survive, but in many ways to to thrive and uh, to set us up for this new season that we that we are in. Part of that is the longing for the family to gather together again. I've talked with many of our older people, and uh, uh, a lot of them are, are already making plans to. Uh, to come back uh, to, to rejoin us. And I can tell you how much that brings me joy. Because it's fun and as great as it is to come in here to gather, to gather when the whole family gets together, it, it's, it's, it's like you have a holiday and somebody can't make it in, and you're like, we're in but we miss them. Because Central Baptist Church is it's a church that uh, I, I wouldn't be a church forever. I want to be a church for, for one that we might consider to be the better. One that, you know, that doesn't feel like they have a place anywhere. May we be a place where they're open to come. A place where, you know, where someone that spent their whole life in the church, but, you know, in this season, it's just got them out of that. They just, you know, they move away and don't feel the need. May this be a church for them. May it be a church for our community. Yes, this is our church, but it's it's God's church. But we're stewards of it. I pray, pray for what the future looks like. I pray that we would remain faithful to what this church was like at the very beginning. But I pray, I pray that this would just be the the next chapter of the number. Not a